Alrighty, so this is the fourth and final video for today's support for our asynchronous learning. Um, I know it's a lot, but we are coming to the end of the class, so I'm trying to provide as much backup uh, supporting video content as possible. So yesterday in class, we looked at Act 3, Scene 1 of Hamlet, and near the middle of that scene, we actually have the most famous soliloquy by Hamlet. I call it soliloquy number four. Soliloquy, that's hard to say, right? Um, and we can see here that this is the way we're marking our page, uh, our sorry, our act, scene, and line rage for our citations. Um, and so here is the prompt. And what I'm going to show you down below is essentially the writing that I've done. So I did the planning phase in class yesterday. Uh, and this will be a look at my completed paragraph. So just a chance to look at what your finalized paragraph could or should look like for Thursday's in-class writing assignment. So here's the prompt. So reread and rewatch Hamlet's fourth soliloquy, which is Act 3, Scene 1, Lines 56 to 89. This is the to be or to not to be speech. What is Hamlet truly debating here? Analyze this section of the play and write a paragraph that includes at least two literary windows and two to four citations in support or for support. So you can see their keywords are analyze. Uh, we're looking at that specific section of the play and we're really trying to dig into what Ham Hamlet is talking about here. What is his self-talk or his debate about? You need to have two literary windows and you need to have at least two up to four citations for support. So then I restated the question, what is Hamlet, what is this discussion he's having with himself about? Can I find the relevant literary forms? And which lines do I think will work for citations? So then I've started to take notes. This is the questioning about life, why should I carry on? And then I've pulled my um, act, scene, and line range. This would help me with my citations. So then we've got metaphor, we've got our literary devices. I've, I've found an alpha level, the metaphor, slings and arrows, whips and scorns. Um, and we may encounter difficulties that we can't control. So that's what we're talking about here. This is actually a braided device because we have the metaphor paired up with an example of personification, right? He talks about fortune um, and fortune is almost stated as an enemy or a conflicting force. Uh, we also have personification of the flesh flesh and then there's a thematic question of there's the rub which kind of means here's the core issue at hand or here's the trouble or here's the problem and then this is actually the wrong word so we'll fix that uh, thus humans will bear great hardship to live on because they fear the unknown of death we also have an example of personification in terms of time again being cast as an enemy and we have that uh, that great line the whips and scorns of time so again that's a braided device where we have whips and scorns are actually metaphors for just the difficulties of getting older, right? And then time is kind of cast as this evil, almost overlord that's whipping us as we get older, right? It's kind of a <laughs> powerful image, really. Um, and so then we've got the core issue. Hamlet has identified this very human weakness within himself. Sometimes he thinks it would be easier not to go on. However, the unknown of this next step of our process is, is what gives humans a fearful reason to carry on. So then the literary devices are the alpha level, personification plus metaphor, the omega level, the theme of death or fear versus duty. So from that, I've created my paragraph. So let's read through it and look at the component pieces. Humanity conflicts against death and her minions. Okay, oh, it's a pretty good title actually. Shakespeare's masterpiece Hamlet. So again, we need to italicize this. It's a title of a play, a story, a novel. We italicize those is often considered his most introspective play. And this is because of the many speeches where Hamlet discusses his mortality and duties as a son. So there I go, I've, I've really introduced in my topic sentence the core theme or the omega level that I'm, I'm looking at. Um, carry on. In his most famous speech from Act 3, Scene 1, Hamlet is debating about the value of life. Why should we live, he asks when life heaps such troubles upon us. Shakespeare uses a braided device to empower the compelling nature, a braided, we'll just add that in there, 
a braided alpha level device to empower the compelling nature of the tragic hero's question. He cast fate, and I put that in the past tense. We can predict there is a citation coming up. Yes, indeed. Um, he cast fate as a godlike power and stated that this divine mind is firing wounding weapons at humans constantly. So wounding weapons is obviously my paraphrase for the slings, the slings and arrows that fortune casts at us. And I paraphrased fortune as fate. So you can see I'm using my paraphrasing tools. I'm using synonyms and I'm rephrasing the original into my own voice using my own sentence structures. Um, so let's read it again. He casts fate as a godlike power and stated that this divine mind is firing wounding weapons at humans constantly, almost cruelly, and humanity had no choice but to bear it out, to bear it or end themselves. And so then I've included, let's not forget to italicize this, the play, the date of publication, we're going with 1601, and then the different lines that capture this. So you can see these are actually two line markers, right? Act, act three, scene one, line 58, and act one, act, act three, scene one, lines 50, 75 and 76. You can see my dyslexia there in my mind. I flipped those numbers around uh, accidentally. Okay, here readers interpret a powerful combination of personification and metaphor. So there I'm really talking directly about the literary devices. Now I'm gonna carry on with my analysis. Fate is portrayed with a thinking mind and the bolts and stones she hurls seems seem aimed with malicious intent. Thus, readers can see that Hamlet is bemoaning his loss and repelled by the duty he sees that he must uphold. But will he find the courage to do the hard thing and revenge his father's heinous murder? So you can see I'm, I've got quite a nice mix here in my analysis of talking about the devices, but also really discussing the core debate that Hamlet is holding with himself and unpacking it for my readers. So that's kind of what we would call my first example or my first window. He goes on to lie the crux of the matter. I need to rephrase that here. He goes on to as he sees it, to okay lay it's supposed to be, to lay, good. He goes on to lay the crux of the matter as he sees it, bare. He only toils through this battlefield of life, dodging fate's attacks and enduring time's derisions and lashes because he fears the unknown of, I kind of blended my pronouns there, of his final journey. However, readers can sense a hint of curiosity and intelligence in Hamlet's metaphor for death. He likens it to a final destination, a new nation unknown where we will go but not return from. Again, so we're going to italicize this. In particular, the fact that he, and again, the, this is from Act 3, Scene 1, Lines 78 to 81. So you can go back and double check that, but that's the undiscovered country part. Obviously, I've paraphrased that as a new nation unknown. In particular, the fact that he ends his phrasing with this statement of this statement with the question is intriguing and, with little surprise, based on the fact that returning home to Elsinore to find his father mysteriously slain and his lecherous uncle as triumphant usurper, it is not significantly surprising that Hamlet may want to travel to a new country and remain there even if the country is death. That, perhaps, would take less courage than the task that he senses lays before him." Okay, so you can see I've basically fulfilled the prompt, right? It's, it's um, did I bark? Let's check the word count on this and that'll give us an idea of how long. And you can see that the majority of this was actually analysis, right? There's a lot of my own voice here. So it is a little bit of a longer paragraph, um, 353. So we'll just add that word count to the end. It's a good idea for all of these assignments for your essay or for paragraphs like this, 353. And for Thursdays in class, Hamlet paragraph. 
the ideal range will be between 250 and 450. So you do have enough space to develop your ideas. I'm giving you a plenty of a window. And we did have two, we had a two literary kind of windows of analysis there. Uh, there's a, there's discussion of personification, metaphor, theme. So we have plenty going on there. And there were two su supporting citations. So I have fulfilled the original prompt. Um, and that'll give you a chance to look at what the development and writing of this type of paragraph should 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 be shown as when you complete the assignment yourself on Thursday. Now, obviously, the prompt will be different than this one, but it's good practice to see uh, the, the process. Excellent work. Well done. Good luck.